in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil while we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize. To see the captive's hearts release, the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace. We lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. We pray revive this earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. We pray. Unleash your kingdom's power. Reaching the near and far, no force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. You made us force much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us, fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are your church. We are the your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. Good morning. Welcome to Twiggenham. Thanks for coming out to be with us today. If you are a guest, and I've been able to meet several this morning, we are so glad you're here. Every church in Huntsville is going to say that. We mean it. <laughs> they do too. But hey, we're, we're really glad you're here. There's a card on the seat in front of you, uh, back of the seat in front of you. You fill that out and place it in the collection plate when it passes a little bit later in the service. Speaking of collection plates... Today is a day that we've been praying about and talking about for weeks now, um, and it's the day that we take up our yearly contribution for our mission focus, uh, the Hacienda of Hope uh, in Ecuador. It's a children's home and school. We had uh, Justin and Jonna here a couple of weeks ago to talk a little bit about uh, what's been going on down there, touching heartbreaking, heartwarming, faith-building stories are happening in Ecuador. It's, it's the, uh, so important to our church, uh, so important to the kids and the families that are being served down there, and we believe truly so important to God. And so we're taking up a special contribution for that today. That funds our mission work down there. And our goal this morning is two seventy six is two two hundred seventy six thousand dollars two seventy two. Okay, we're going to go for 276. He said 272. I don't know. Somebody's going to kick in that extra four grand, okay? That's a huge number. 
it's a huge need. And so we're just uh, glad to be a part of it. And that, we'll hear more about that in just, just a moment. Can I ask you to stand? Go ahead and stand with me for a second here. And I want to share a passage with you. Here's the truth. If we don't leave here every Sunday more committed to serving God by blessing others, we've missed, we missed the point. It is all about serving others. Our songs are going to reflect the focus on others this morning. And I want you to listen to this passage from Psalm 47 as we prepare to continue our time of praise. Clap your hands, all you nations. Okay, it's not, not just one country that God is inviting into relationship, into worship. It's all nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. Joy is not just for Americans or North Americans or Southerners or people in Alabama or Alabama fans or Auburn fans or Georgia fans. God wants everybody to be filled with that joy. For the, and here's why. Because the Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth, everywhere, every person. And until all of them know and serve and are blessed by God, our job is not finished. Let's praise him this morning, the King of all the earth. Christ for the world we see, the world to Christ we bring, with loving zeal, the poor and them that mourn, the faint and overborn, sin sick and sorrow With us the cross to bear for Christ our Lord. Cause everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. The hope of nations, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Surrender all, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus 
conquered the grave. You're my Savior. You can move the mountains. God, you are mighty to save. You are mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, you rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. As we share from a reading in Revelation this morning, would you join the reading at the appropriate time? After this, I looked. And there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Salvation belongs to our God who sins the throne and unto the Lamb be praise and glory wisdom and thanks honor and power and strength be to our God forever Just a minute, we're going to take our contribution, but before we do that this morning, if you would give your attention uh, to this video that reminds us about what we're doing and what everything that's going on in Ecuador at the Hacienda. <laughs> You know, originally, if, if I understand it, the goal was, you know, we were going to have an orphanage with 200 kids, five casas, you know, or haciendas. And, um, 
as we grew and understood the challenges of, of having that many orphans and so forth, plus the challenges we found in the schools in Ecuador, uh, we were led, uh, I truly believe we were led by God to start the school for lots of reasons. But, you know, then it became its own outreach. And so we went, we, we changed, we adjusted, we adjusted, I believe, with God's hand leading us in a certain way to have now up to 40, and we may grow beyond that. We may find other ways to do that uh, in the near future, but and also in the school, and, and have different ways to outreach and, and be able to service uh, folks appropriately. Uh, but it, our goals have changed, but they've, they've changed as, as God has led us, and I think clearly pointed us down certain directions that we needed to go to provide the best service to the kids that we were dealing with. You know, the, there's a number of ways that God has led us. In fact, I, I'll be the first to tell you that I, I was not in favor of the school when we first started. Uh, just because I, I wasn't sure that's really what we wanted, but as I watched it unfold and as we worked our way through it, I, I became a believer that that was part of what we needed to be doing, and that's where God was leading us. But I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't on the side of the school to start with. So, you know, when you when you watch that unfold and you're on the other side and you watch it unfold the other way, you kind of know you got led there. You didn't, you know, because you didn't start there, you got led there. Uh, the same thing with with changing directors and so forth. Things happen, situations happen, and it, and even though at the time it, it seemed um, bad. It, it was it was hard, and and you look back now and you think, man, that's exactly what needed to happen to make this mission successful and do better as we go forward. And that's exactly what's happened. But at the time, you could ask a bunch of people, and we'd have said, wow, this is terrible. What what are we doing? Uh, but we've seen those changes happen, and we've seen God lead us to where where we are today, which is in a very good place and doing some great service for the for the people of Ecuador. I, I was going to say, I, I wasn't part of the, the committee that made the first decision. I, I was in favor of it at the end of the day as part of the congregation. Uh, my passion for that was that I truly believe this was, a, this was a mission where, you know, you can't just talk Jesus and talk the gospel. You've got to show it and demonstrate it. And this is a way where you could reach out to a country for children, people who have no way to defend themselves other than having us come in and support that. And they don't, and, and Ecuador doesn't have the kind of services. So we went down on a hillside and created an environment, a safe environment for children to heal. And they come with some, some baggage, and that's our role. And, and we shine to the community around us as showing Christ. And we, don't, we talk it too, and we have a congregation, but we're there to service children and demonstrate Christ in their lives. Yeah, the interesting thing is that I don't know if people understood when they made the decision to make this our mission and our main focus, uh, what exactly that meant. Uh, it was a passion and, and an interest to focus on a particular mission. Uh, and what we, what we find ourselves is that, uh, you know, it's grown. The Lord has blessed us a lot. On the other hand, it takes lots of funds to support that. And we've continued to grow and continue to provide more services down there to more, to more people. And we find ourselves as the backstop. Right? We have other funds coming in, whatever, but Twickenham is the backstop. The buck stops here. And so, yes, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, faith it takes to continue to say, I'm, a, I'm going to fund this and we're going to be the back of this forevermore. Right? Uh, and, and we think about that a lot in, in the committee and other places in terms of uh, we've got to continually have people excited about this and, and behind this and have the same passion that, that a lot of us have had in terms of, of funding this and continue to have this service provided and to continue to grow and do more things in Ecuador than we're doing today as the Lord provides us and guides us in the future. Let's take our offering. I'm laying down my life I'm giving up control I'm never looking back I surrender all I'm living for your glory on the earth This passion in my heart This stirring in my soul To see the nations bow For all the world to know I'm living for your glory on the earth. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. Light a flame in my soul for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me.
like a fire in me. This passion in my heart, this stirring in my soul, to see the nations bow, for all the world to know, I'm living for your glory on the earth. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me, light a flame in my soul for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. For every knee to bow down, for every heart to believe, for every voice to cry out, burn like a fire in me. For every tongue to confess that you alone are the key, you are the hope of the earth, burn like a fire in me. In me, for the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me, light a flame in my soul for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me, for the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me, light a flame in my soul for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me, a fire in me, burn like a fire in me, a fire in me, burn like a fire in me. Now we'll pray over the offering as John comes and leads that blessing. Let's pray. Holy God, we praise you, we worship you as our creator, our provider, our sustainer. Father, we we humbly submit ourselves knowing that uh, all good things come from you. And Father, we, we lift up this offering to you this morning. We ask you to bless it. We ask you to bless the children, to bless Justin and Jonna and Jake and Tanya as they work to, uh, to further this, this program and to touch the, the people of Ecuador. And Father, just as you made a covenant with uh, the people of Israel, you've made a covenant with us through your son Jesus. And it's because of Jesus and through Jesus that, that we respond, that we, we make this offering, that we give our hearts that we are led by your spirit. Thank you, Father, for the opportunities you provide us, for the resources you provide. We pray that you will will bless this this offering as an overflow of, of your love. And Father, we pray especially for the children, for the children in Ecuador, that they will know you, that they will step into relationship with you that they will call on your name. And it's through Jesus we pray, amen. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, he's the open. focused on others in all that we've done and said. Jody's lesson this morning will be about others and joining with the world. And we realize that's important because we realize the need that people have. And I hope that we realize the need that people have because we realize our own need, our own lostness, our own need for forgiveness. And certainly we're reminded of that anytime we share the Lord's Supper together as we will again this morning. So as we take the bread and the juice May we be mindful of our own, the grace that has been extended to us 
as we try to be Jesus' hands and feet to others. Let's pray together. God, as always, we are grateful for the sacrifice of your son, for the body that was broken, and for what that means for us. And in some ways, may we break our own bodies so that we too might give as you did. Bless us as we take this bread. This is our prayer in Jesus' name and all the degrees say, amen. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, He's the open door. People need. God, again, we offer thanks for the blood that was poured out on our behalf as we have so richly received. May we richly give. Remembering all that you've done for us, may our lives be lives of devotion and sacrifice to honor and glorify and praise your name. Thank you for Jesus and for his sacrifice. Bless us as we take this cup. In Jesus' name we pray and all the degrees say, amen.
Come to the table of mercy, prepared with the wine and the bread. All who are hungry and thirsty, come and your souls will be fed. Come to the table of mercy, prepared with the wine and the bread. All who are hungry and thirsty, come and your souls will be fed. Come at the Lord's invitation. Receive from his nail-scarred hand. Eat of the bread of salvation. Drink of the blood of the Lamb. Come to the table of mercy. Prepare with the wine and the bread. All who are hungry. Come and your souls will be fed. Come at the Lord's invitation. Receive from his nail-scarred hand. Eat of the bread of salvation. Drink of the blood. So I don't know if, I don't remember where I told this story. It may have been in a class, in which case most of you didn't hear it because some of you don't come to class. <laughs> or I may have told it in here. But if I can't remember it, then I'm guessing some of you won't remember it either. It's a great story either way. So anyway, on the surface... Our church in Atlanta looked really good. Upper middle class, well-educated, family-friendly, biblically literate, progressive, grace-oriented, open-minded, generous, a, a lot like Twickenham. We, we just presented well. We presented well. And the truth is, there, there really were a lot of serious, gung-ho, committed Christians in our church who didn't just look good on the surface, they were good to, the, good to the bone, good to the soul. Uh, but as in any group, there was also a subset that camouflaged their family dysfunction and their spiritual brokenness beneath a thin but well-maintained appearance of perfection. Sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference between people who, by the grace of God, have it pretty much together, and those who work hard at looking like they have it together. And I know that's a fact because I've been both people. Anyway, so that was, that was kind of our church. And then I'm going to call them Bob and Alice, not their real names, but they're real people. Bob and Alice started attending our shiny church. And they were an obvious mess, both individually and as a couple. It was at least a second marriage for both of them. Both of them were recovering addicts. They struggled financially. They struggled relationally. They struggled spiritually. They were about as rough around the edges as we were smooth and polished. Some of you will remember, you've been in church long enough to remember this. Do you remember when... You were maybe when you were growing up between church and Sunday school or Sunday school and church, the deacons would go out and smoke on the front porch. <laughs> Remember that? And the elders too. Okay. That was just back in the sixties and seventies. That's, that's what, what, what you did. Um, this was when Bob and Alice showed up our church, we were in the mid nineties. And so pretty much everybody quit smoking at that point, but not Bob and Alice. They would, in between church and Sunday school, they'd go out and smoke, and they'd be out there greeting visitors, going, hey, welcome, glad you're here today. So, so we were like, geez, right? They were just a little rough around the edges. 
So I had them at my office one afternoon to try and mediate their latest feud. It did not go well. Uh, in fact, it turned into a world-class, wall-scorching, full-volume cuss fight. Uh, I'm not, I grew up in rural Georgia, okay? So I'm not, I'm not all that refined. They used words and they combined words with each other that I had never heard before. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, they were, and they came this close to physical blows. It was about to get, and I'm not sure who was gonna win, either Bob or Alice. I mean, it was gonna be a big one. And so I, I said to Alice, I said, look, I, I opened the door and I said, why don't you just step out for a minute and cool off? And then I, I, I had never done this before and I haven't done it since, but I, now, now this is in my office with all my theology books up on the wall and everything, the, you know, crosses on the wall and church stuff. I looked at Bob, who was just as wound up as Alice, and I said, Bob, light a cigarette, open the window and blow the smoke out the window, all right? Just to chill. I needed him to chill. I needed her to chill. So she agreed to step out, but as she did, bless you, she let loose with a rather impressive and deeply coarse parting rhetorical flourish. It so happened that one of our sons was with me that afternoon. I don't remember why he was there. We, we didn't have anywhere to put him, so he had to come to me to the office. He was down the hall in the office kitchen, the church office kitchen, playing a video game, when he heard Alice tell Bob what he could do with his opinions, our son stepped out into the hallway to see what the commotion was, and his eyes were big as silver dollars. You know, there's a, there's a look a parent can give a child when the child knows, Dad's not playing this time. This is not a time for me to push the boundaries. So I gave him that look, and he was like back in the kitchen, you know. And we had to have a talk later about what all those words were and how you don't use those at church around the elders and stuff. So <laughs> Bob and Alan, they were just a mess. I mean, a, an ill-fitting, out of our comfort zone, totally unlike the rest of us mess. And they were one of the best things God ever did to our church. One of the best things God ever did. We'll come back to Bob and Alice in just a moment. We're in Joshua chapter 2 in a series called Joshua Faith for Where We've Never Been. And um, that's, a, that's an important series for us right now. Um, the book of Joshua is about Israel who comes to the border of the promised land. They've been there before, but they've been no further. So they're about to go to a place they've never been. They're, they're about to do things they've never done, see things they've never seen, experience new experiences, and they need a unique faith to get them across the Jordan and into that promise. In some ways, we are where they are. The truth is, every day we're where Israel was because we never know, we've never been into the future. We don't know how to get there. We don't know what's there. So we need a faith to get us there. But Twickenham in particular is in a unique place in that regard. At the end of this month, and this is something I want you to be praying about. At the end of this month, our shepherds and our ministry staff are going to take a couple of days away. And we're going to go off with a brother named John Mulliken, who works with a, 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 an organization called Hope Network. And John is going to help us think through how to develop a process that involves all of us in discerning together where God is taking this church, to really get clearer about what God wants of us and where God wants us to go. And it's going to be a place we've never been. So we're going to need a faith that can get us there. I want you to be praying about that. That's one of the reasons we're taking a look at the book of Joshua. So this morning we're in Joshua chapter 2. And um, here's the story. I'm just going to tell the, the stories. A lot of you will know this. It'll be new for others. Joshua and Israel are poised to cross the Jordan River and enter the Promised Land. The first major city they're going to encounter was Jericho. And from their perspective, it appeared absolutely impenetrable. The walls were, of the city were high and wide, 
and the army that defended that city was already well prepared and gearing up for battle. I mean, everybody knew Israel was out there. This was not going to be a sneak attack. Uh, the, the Jericho's army was ready. So in verse 1, Joshua secretly recruits two spies to sneak into the city, presumably to assess Jericho's defenses. And the first place they went was to the house of a prostitute named Rahab. A curious decision, to be sure. They, either the spies were not near as stealthy as they thought, or the intelligence apparatus in Jericho was remarkably effective. Because no sooner had the spies arrived than the king of Jericho was, for, was informed not just of their presence, but of their location. And the king sent men to tell Rahab to hand them over. So they go, and they say to her, give us the men that have come to spy out the land. And she says, well, they were here, but when it came time to close the city gates, they left. You know, if you hurry, you might be able to catch them. So y'all go, go get them. And so the, they take off. She's lying, of course. And apparently she's very good at it. She had hidden the spies on the roof, but the king's men believed her, so off they go chasing ghosts for the next three days. So I want to pick the story up in verse 8, Joshua chapter 2, verse 8, and I'm reading from the New International Version. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have learned how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. That's not a part of the Joshua story. Earlier, Israel had been in battle with, against these two kings, Sihon and Og, and they, they soundly defeated them. Verse 11, we heard, when we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you, for the Lord your God is God of heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you by hiding them on the roof and lying to the guards and sending them away. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Verse 14 is their reply. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. There was still one other detail that had to be worked out. How would Israel's advancing army know which house now stood under God's protection? Because that's what the spies had promised her. That's what they said they would give her, God's protection. And so the spies told Rahab to hang a scarlet cord in the window and to gather her entire family inside her home for safety. She did, and they kept their promise. We'll skip ahead real quick to Joshua chapter 6, verse 25. Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. The difference in emotional tone between Joshua chapters 1 and 2 is, is remarkable. It's, it's a very stark difference. Chapter 1 is all about courage and reassurance and fearlessness. Words to that effect come up five times in Joshua chapter 1. You keep reading that phrase, be strong and courageous, right? Chapter 2 is all about fear. The people of Jericho are seized with anxiety. Their hearts are melting in fear. That phrase, melting in fear, comes up a couple of times. Their courage has failed. In fact, five times, it's in Joshua 1, five times words about courage come up. In Joshua 2, five times words about fear come up. So here is this fortress city gripped in fear, and in the middle of it is a prostitute named Rahab. Actually, she's not in the middle of the city. 
Her house is built into the wall. Geographically, she lives at the margins. I mean, literally, she lives at the margin of the city, at the most insecure and exposed place in Jericho. If there's a battle, you don't want to be on the wall. You don't want to be living on the wall. You want to be somewhere in the middle of the city because that's the safest place. But she does not live in a safe place. The truth is, even if she lived in the shadow of the king's palace, right there on Main Street, Rahab would still be vulnerable because of at least three reasons. First of all, she was a woman. And in that time and culture, there was no hashtag Me Too movement to protect her. She wasn't just a woman, she was a single woman. And third, she worked in what we delicately call these days the sex trade. The men she knew used her. The women of the town hated her guts. And it's probably the case that her own family was deeply ashamed from her and had wanted to distance themselves from her. Her gender, her marital status, and her profession left her profoundly powerless, exposed, and insecure. And yet here she is in the Bible. Other than Joshua, she is the only named character in that story. The spies are not named. The the soldiers that the king sends to arrest the spies are not named. The king himself remains anonymous to us. The only person who is esteemed enough to be recognized by name is the vulnerable, profoundly insecure prostitute Rahab. It's almost as if God is not at all embarrassed that she is a part of of what he is doing in Jericho. Now, some of you know this already, but Rahab comes up at least three more times in other parts of the Bible. Closer to the end of the book of James, James calls her righteous. The book of Hebrews, probably written by the Apostle Paul, lists her as a heroine of faith. And then Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, tells us that one of her descendants was Israel's greatest king, David. But her most famous descendant was none other than Jesus himself. A prostitute in Jericho was an ancestor of Jesus. I would say that's a surprising thing, that God would welcome somebody like Rahab into his story, but it really is not a surprising thing. It happens all the time. All through Scripture, the most unlikely people become a part of what God is doing in the world. A man named Abraham, a, a, wanderer, you know, a wanderer named Abraham, a guy who can't stay put in one place, and his barren wife, Sarah, become central to the story of what God is going to do in the world. A young widow from Moab named Ruth a Syrian general named Naaman, a Babylonian king named Nebuchadnezzar, a rough-around-the-edges couple named Bob and Alice. You know how natives of a small town will sometimes refer to new people who haven't learned the local customs and culture by saying, they're not from around here? God just isn't reluctant to welcome and include people who are in terms of the lives they've lived and the baggage they carry, not from around here. He's apparently very comfortable welcoming folks like that. You and I encounter people like Rahab every day. I mean, people who are profoundly different from us. They they may not believe in God at all. Or they may believe in God, but they figure that they're not welcome in his story because of their gender confusion or their sexual orientation or their relational wreckage that they've left in their wake or the baggage they lug behind them from bad decisions that they've made or their eating disorders or their struggles with their addictions or pornography or a million other reasons. Scripture suggests 
that God is more ready to welcome them than they realize. And if we're being honest, he's more willing to welcome them than we are. And I include me in that, we. It is much more my preference to spend time and energy with people who look like me and dress like me and especially people who think like me because they're right. (laughs) People who live like me. I like to spend time with people like me. That's why people like Bob and Alice are a blessing. Because if we welcome them, they show up in our lives, they show up in our church and all of their unorthodox, unconventional, eccentric, and maybe even offensive strangeness, and they become walking, talking parables of the gospel. They remind me that I'm a sinner and God welcomed me. So who in the world am I to be unwelcoming? Look through Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And we've already been reading through that in our, our reading plan, but go back again and look at it and notice how many times over and over and over and over God tells Israel to welcome and bless the alien, to show kindness to the foreigners, to the strangers who live among them. Because he says, you were aliens and strangers in Egypt, so you've got to show kindness and welcome to the strangers among you. Happens dozens of times through those three books. Now some of us, I guess, I'm I'm suspecting here, are entirely comfortable with this message and we embrace it. Glad to hear it. It's about time. Others of us, not so much. So in the spirit of making everybody feel a little bit uncomfortable this morning, let's look at something else then. There's another part of the story we need to hear. God and Israel welcomed Rahab. She integrated into Israel. She married a man named Salmon, and she became a member of the tribe of Judah. But in order to do that, there were some things that Rahab had to leave behind, her profession for one. By becoming a part of Israel, she was called to live a morally pure life and to be faithful to her husband in marriage just like every other Israelite. And she had to give up her allegiance to the gods of Canaan. She was headed in that direction when the spies met her. But she wasn't there yet because here's what she said about God. She said, the Lord your God, not the Lord my God. Faith cannot be held vicariously has to be personal. She had to make that move, and apparently she did. And she had to submit all of her life to the law of God. Like every other Israelite, she had to learn to love the Lord her God with all her heart and all her soul and all her strength and her neighbor as herself. I am certain that didn't happen overnight. It never does. But that's what would have been required for Rahab to move into and become a part of Israel. You go back and read Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers about all the the, the regulations about the foreigner and the alien and the stranger among you. Israel is required to be welcoming to them. The foreigner, the stranger, and the alien are required to obey God's laws just like Rahab, just like Israelites were. So here's where I'm going with this. In our effort to be welcoming, to be accepting, we have to avoid two extremes. And and this is so hard. We we have to avoid, on on the one hand, requiring some law or practice that God does not require, and on the other hand, relaxing some law or practice that he does require. Something that God does not, what we're basically telling him is, God, you didn't know where to draw the line. So we're going to, you drew it here, but we think the line ought to go here because we just think that's where it ought to go. The, the Bible is really clear on how God feels about people who add to his word, and we do not want to go there. Okay, he, he does not warm up to that. On the other hand, we don't get to erase lines that God has drawn. See, the cultural tide these days, and for quite some time now, has been flowing in the opposite direction. We're we're tempted to embrace a more 
flexible faith to tell the Rahabs and the Bobs and the Alices of the world that God accepts them just as they are, that he's perfectly willing to permit them to continue in the life to which they've grown accustomed. Just come on in and bring all your stuff with you and it's okay. We're reluctant to use words like sin and salvation, repentance and righteousness, confession and commitment. Do you remember that story where there's the woman that's been caught in adultery and they bring her to Jesus and he's riding in the sand? It's in the Gospel of John. Remember that, what, what he says? He, he says to her, woman, where are those who have accused you? And they've all gone. And then he says, neither do I condemn you. Which is, we like to say that. I mean, isn't that easy to say? Neither do I condemn you. We really enjoy saying that. We kind of want to have a neither do I condemn you approach to the world. It's easy to do that. A lot easier to do that than to speak the rest of that famous saying of Jesus, go your way and sin no more. Jesus was the greatest welcomer ever. Here's what he said, though, in Matthew 28. Make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. If we leave out the call to obedience, to what are we welcoming people? Now, I'm telling you, this is an exceptionally difficult balance to maintain. On the one hand, welcoming people with grace and mercy and kindness and love and taking them where they are and on the other hand calling them to obedience and righteousness and holy living critical but difficult balance to maintain which is why what Jesus said next is so encouraging he said in Matthew 28 I'm with you always even to the end of the age so where are we going with all this Here's my prayer, what I've been praying this week about this message was that you and I would open our eyes to the Rahabs in our world. Just open our eyes and see them. And that may mean that you need to go to places where you're likely to find people who are not like you. Try the coffee shop at Low Mill. Trust me, there are people not like you there. Or maybe because of who you are, you need to attend the local meeting of the NRA. More than likely... The people that we need to see and welcome live right across the street or they're sitting by themselves at lunch in the cafeteria or they're the people at work that nobody likes and nobody invites out for drinks after work. We started with a story about Bob and Alice this morning. They eventually moved away from our church and our community in Atlanta and I got to tell you the truth, I have no idea where they are. I have no idea where they wound up. They may well be in Huntsville for all I know. So if you see them, invite them to come to church with you. They probably need us. I'm certain we need them. Let's pray together. Well, Lord, thank you for this story about Rahab. And thank you for welcoming her into your nation. And thank you for all of those Israelites who apparently welcomed her too because she became famous, a famous faith story. And so we're encouraged and challenged by that and we just pray that we would be able to welcome the Rahabs, the Bobs, the Alices that we know and encounter. And God, help us to realize that It's not because of how good we are that we get to welcome people, but it's because of how good you are. You have welcomed us despite our sin, failure, despite the baggage that we bring and the wreckage that we left behind us. You've welcomed us. And so we have no choice but to be welcoming of others. Help us to be a church that finds that balance between extending grace and calling people to obedience. 
That's a hard balance to maintain, God, and we struggle, we get confused about it, so we pray for wisdom. We pray that every day we would wake up and realize that because you have blessed us with a relationship and with forgiveness and with mercy, that we can go out and be a blessing to extend relationship, offer grace, and show kindness. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to uh, finish up here with some family news for you. First of all, I want to welcome uh, one of our guests this morning, John Mark Smith. John Mark, can you stand up so folks can kind of see who you are? Uh, give him a hand. John is uh, the regional director for Eastern European Missions. That's a well-respected mission organization, and they are going to be hosting a benefit at Burrett on the Mountain uh, in Huntsville on Tuesday evening at six o'clock, uh, at seven o'clock on March sixth. Thank you. John Martin, you come by and say hello to him, get some more information about that, or go to eem.eem.org for more information about that. Uh, also, there's a wedding shower this afternoon for Adam Sampley and Jennifer Paulson. That'll be in the Mercy Building. It's 1.30 to 3. Uh, kids, to, to Friday night, you guys have got to lock in uh, this Friday night. And then I love this particular ministry for a children's ministry, Love in Action. Big note in the bulletin about that this week, Saturday, March 10th. Uh, Amy Smith, our children's minister, and our children's families will be doing exactly that, putting their love into action. There's a note in the bulletin. You can check on that. And if you're a parent of a kid, your family needs to get involved in that. Hey, let me ask you to stand. Let me leave you with a blessing here. and We'll be dismissed. Really glad you were here this morning. This is from the book of Numbers, chapter 6. And it's, it's what uh, God told Moses to tell the priests to bless the people with. And I'm going to ask you to take this blessing because you're priests. We are all priests in the kingdom of God. This is your mission this week, to take this blessing to the world. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Go be a blessing this week. Thanks for coming. <laughs>